So we're going to talk about possibilities, and we are going to talk about factors. So obviously, this is uh, something we are seeing a lot more of. Um, it's not just your feeling. We've actually looked at those numbers. Without a doubt, we are seeing a lot more of this, um, and I don't think that that's going to stop for any time soon. So we do want to make sure that we are providing these patients the best care possible. I know it can be challenging sometimes, um, but we'll we'll kind of go over the importance of really why we want to be doing this correctly for all of these folks. So, Okay, so uh, I'm just going to review a little bit about the kind of pathophysiology of uh, alcohol. So during acute alcohol use, so you go out on a Friday night, decide you're going to put back a couple. Um, in a normal situation, you kind of go back, our nervous system kind of has two simultaneous pathways going. You have the kind of excitatory pathways, and this is what's called the NMDA. Uh, and that's through a um, neurotransmitter called glutamate. You also have these sort of inhibitory pathways, and that's on the other side. That's the uh, GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric acid. Um, so normal life, those are kind of not really competing, but working in balance to keep everything um, going straight uh, without problems. And then you add the acute alcohol. So alcohol is, does stimulate that inhibitory pathway, basically. So people think, well, at first it kind of, um, it causes a little bit of calming. It can, in high doses, cause fatigue. It has inhibition of control, so some people can act a little bit wild on it. But if they keep drinking long enough, most people just pass out and go to sleep. So that's what sort of the acute alcohol looks like. The issue is that if you keep your body in that situation and you keep taking in alcohol over and over again, your body is going to start looking at this and saying, well, I need to make some adjustments to try to basically give this person a more normal life because they're just going to keep drinking alcohol. So you actually, the brain cells themselves will start regulating those neurotransmitters to kind of put you back into a more normal state, even with alcohol present. And so chronic alcohol looks more like this. So because the ethanol is a suppressant, what your neuro, what your brain is going to do is start releasing more of these excitatory neurostimulators. So basically you'll start producing more glutamate. And so what that does then over time, it basically allows folks to function with alcohol levels of 100 or 200, et cetera, and look completely sober, basically. Their brain is kind of back to a normal level of functioning, even with a lot of ethanol on board. Um, so, you know, that seems okay. There we go. Literally, their brain needs those inhibitory medicines to kind of to return to a more normal state. And if we don't provide it for them, they will continue to progress and can eventually progress to seizures, coma, death. And that's really untreated severe alcohol withdrawal. You find an outcome definitely can be death. So do know this is a deadly thing if we don't treat it, just like if we didn't treat a diabetic and they progressed to being diabetic. So um, just know there is a reason why they are acting like that, and it's not just to make you mad. Um, so they really are having a significant impact. So to diagnose not alcohol withdrawal, but rather to diagnose alcohol use disorder, it's actually pretty complex. Do not, you don't have to read all this little stuff, but this is the DSM-5, which is the big uh, psychiatric manual that tells us how you actually diagnose substance abuse disorder, specifically your alcohol use. It is actually very complicated. That's not what we're really trying to do when they come into the hospital. What we're trying to do here 
is just make sure we are screening to figure out, is this someone who's going to be at high risk to run into problems? And that's our initial step. So the American Society of Addiction Medicine does say that at any time we have a patient in a medical encounter, we should be screening for substance abuse and specifically for alcohol abuse. There are lots of screening tools out here. This is the audit, and it's one of the best studied. But as you can see, it is pretty extensive. So if we're asking you to do this on every single patient, every single medical encounter, that could be a little overwhelming and pretty soon that's all we're doing. So there are other ways to do this. And in fact, there is a condensed version that works really almost as well as the long version called the audit C or the audit condensed. And that's just basically these three questions. How often do you have a drink containing alcohol? How many drinks containing alcohol do you typically have? Based on this scoring system, then we can kind of figure out are they at risk? This does not mean if this is positive, which three is positive in a female and four in a male, it doesn't mean this person's going to go into you know withdrawals. It just means they are at risk, and we at least need to think about what we, we do if this person starts running into issues and do we need to start monitoring them more closely because of this. So the audit scene is the one that we are hoping to use, it is built into Epic. Uh, they are telling me it's, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, issue, but we're hoping to have that out soon and pilot it on four towers so we can at least start looking at some of these folks to say, well, do we think this person's going to be at potential risk? Ideally, then the next step would be is if you get a positive audit, you would then talk to the provider and say, hey, the audit is positive. I just want to let you know, because then what they need to do is think, well, how much do I need to worry about this person? And of course, that's going to depend on lots of things. One of them, certainly the level that this is positive. So we said three is positive in female or four in male. It actually goes up though as high as a 12, you can see. So if you call me and say, hey, their audit is 12, I'm going to be really nervous versus their audit is three. And I'm going to say, oh, okay, that's probably something I want to talk to them some more about. Now, there is another scale that the provider can then use if they want to. And this is something we have on our phone. So I can just pull this up called the pause. It's a little bit different because this is actually looking to see is this person who ideally has a positive audit at high risk to go into moderate to severe alcohol withdrawal. So these are the patients who are definitely at high risk for complications, may end up in the intensive care unit, innovative, et cetera. And so they can use this pause and you can see it is definitely more complex. So this is eight questions that you're going to be asking the patient. We'll also be looking, is it blood alcohol positive when they walk in? And then is there evidence of already that they're maybe having some signs of withdrawals right off the bat? If this one is positive, it is actually incredibly sensitive and that, that the likelihood ratio, if they're above a four, so four points positive, it's 174 times more likely they will go into moderate to severe than if they were less than four. So when this one's positive, it's pretty significant. And those are the patients we really are gonna think, okay, let's just go ahead either and start them on therapy or get them started on the symptom trigger management. So um, this can help their provider using that a little bit more as time goes on. Any questions so far? We touched on a couple topics, just mainly the pathophysiology and the screening, but okay. So um, once we identify somebody that we think is at risk, then certainly one of the ways we can do the screening is called the CWA. So this is the Clinical, Inventor Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment Alcohol revised scale. So um, there are multiple ways, honestly, to kind of check people out to see if they're having issues with withdrawals. This is probably, I'm not going to say the gold standard, but I will say probably the most common across all organizations. The ACE doesn't specify which thing to use for assessment. It just says basically assess them. So we did look at some of the other ones. There's a brief alcohol withdrawal scale. There's a short alcohol withdrawal scale or some folks have created their own scales uh, the critical care unit will use one called Riker and so it really it varies but basically ACM said we can't recommend one above the other all of them look like they operate about equally uh, the CWA is complicated and there's downsides to it uh, one of the reasons we have stuck with this for now is that honestly it's already an epic most people are already familiar with it, and a lot of other institutions are familiar with it. So if you call and we're transferring somebody, you can say, I have a CEO of 18, and we're going to know what you're talking about. If you call, you know, a rap like 10, supposed to go together. Um, so 
you know, I, I think that was one of our main reasons for sticking with this view for now. And, you know, it is something, of course, we want to continue to reassess. But again, based on the current guidelines, they're just like, please just assess, figure out what's the best tool for your organization. So for now, we'll continue to see. The CEO, as you guys know, is complicated. And it does have its downside because a lot of this is subjective. Uh, I think the more we use it and the more they do it, um, the, the less subjectivity it, that goes with it. There are places where all they do, there's literally hospitals that only do alcohol withdrawal. And that's where a lot of the studies come from. And they are amazingly good at doing it because literally this is what they do every hour to every two hours throughout their entire day. So you get to be pretty good. And the other part of it is that as you do it more with individual patients, you're able to kind of look at that patient and be like, oh yeah, they had this, this, and this last time, Ooh, and now they have this. So I think things improve from the first time you do it with an individual patient to the next several times that you do it. But I think it also gets better the more you do this. Just, you know, you know the scale after a while, you're able to read through it. One of the things I do want to point out is it is interesting that hallucinations uh, can sometimes be sort of out of proportion and that can throw people off a little bit uh, because folks with alcohol withdrawal may get the hallucinations before they get anything else. They actually can start with what's called alcoholic hallucinosis which can occur very early in the course, even before any of the other uh, aspects start taking place. Those people are definitely at high risk. So, you know, if you walk in and they're picking at the walls and grabbing at the insects and things, but you're like, none of these other things make sense to me. This guy is just playing me. Do know hallucinations can often start first. So even before you see the fast heart rate, even before you see the tremor, they 100% may be hallucinating. Uh, so do know that's the one thing where I've seen that scale being higher and people are like, I don't know if this is real. It absolutely can be just like that. They can just, and it's usually what I will say, I've seen it's the visual hallucinations that seem to come early on. Um, so that's one of those little caveats about the C word now. Any questions about it or struggling to deal with it? One of the things that we sort of noticed when we were looking through our order set is that the way the current order set is uh, set out, it doesn't make it real clear when to do CWA or how often or remind anybody to do the CWA. And truly, we think that was one of our big problems that we had. So uh, with Nagy's help and Barb's help, we're revising those order sets. Um, so this will actually fire as a task now. So instead of you having to look at a box with like, as far as I can tell, it's like eight font and read that little writing to figure out how often this will go ahead and fire off. It will initially fire off every two hours, and then depending on how the patient's doing, if they're doing terrible, you need to bump that to every hour. If they're starting to be great after a couple times, then you can drop it to every four hours, and then with enough of those every four, and you say, hey, the receiver's less than five, you can actually then eliminate the assessment. But so hopefully that will help make this a little clearer, because um, that's the one thing I found sometimes is those cases we've reviewed where things didn't go right. We had like a CUA that looked really awful, and we just didn't have any CUA for a while. And then suddenly we had a lot of people in the room helping them not to remove the TV from the wall. So I'm you know, hoping that they can do it more often, they'll get more comfortable with it. Uh, and, and I think this, the new orders will hopefully just make it clear how often they do it as well. Okay, uh, so treatment, um, this is one of the things where I think a lot of folks do have questions about is, wow, that's a lot of benzodiazepines we're giving. Do they really need that much? Um, the honest answer is almost certainly they do. So over treatment is the frequent concern. Are we gonna give enough to really sedate this person? They're gonna stop breathing on us. Uh, what I can tell you in somebody truly in alcohol withdrawal, because they have this huge ramp up of these uh, excitatory neurotransmitters, it is going to be very, very difficult to over-sedate them. The under-treatment, how, however, is a huge deal. And these are the folks where if we don't treat them early and we don't treat them aggressively, that CWA scale just keeps climbing and climbing and climbing, and they're going to be a danger to themselves, they're going to be a danger to the others, and they may be those kind of people who just go on and progress in full DTs and alcohol withdrawal seizures because we didn't treat them aggressively early enough. So the kind of the typical sequence of treatment mechanism can be anything from center 
show that we give benzodiazepines appease based on the CEWA assessment, um, not just giving them all the time, but we seem to require less medications. It's interesting that study has been repeated a couple times and maybe falling out of favor. It actually looks like the just doing the CEWA only may not um, be the ideal, so we are trying to look at that. But benzodiazepines nonetheless, they do is bind that same inhibitory channel and pathway and basically provide back that inhibitory neurotransmitter. That's the way that a lot of science of our neurotransmitters, you're adding some of that inhibitory stimulation to tip that scale until they get out of the alcohol. Um, and so it does bind that exact same mechanism. Um, now we are starting to look at phenobarbital. So this is where we Many years. This is interesting. There are now some facilities that own, well, that I would say almost exclusively use phenobarbital, but some don't really even rely on benzodiazepines uh, at all. Um, and it really is some of the kind of cutting edge facilities. So, Mass General, this is where a lot of this data came from, was Mass General to start with. Uh, and then they've kind of spread it out as their fellows go out to various centers. They use it a lot now on the West Coast in Seattle. Uh, Ohio State has one, and Duke has uh, a program, all using phenobarb as a base. Now, in all honesty, they started it to some extent because there was shortages before with benzodiazepines. Well, guess what we're having again? Shortages of benzodiazepines. I just got the thing from Chris Sedell today that pretty much said we're out of all IV benzos is what it looked to me like. So we were switching over to IV diazepam, and it looks like that's real short now, too. So... Phenobarbital, though, even regardless of whether or not there um, is any shortages, the data really does look pretty good. So for those who are not familiar with phenobarbital, it's actually an old anti-epileptic medication. We used to give these for seizures. So before we used to load them with phenytoin, we used to load them with phenobarb. Those used to be at very high doses. So 15 to 30 milligrams per kilogram, and often the 20 to 30 was what was used. At those kind of doses, we did see respiratory depression. So people would sometimes stop breathing. Now, that's always difficult to say if you have somebody seizing, are they stopping breathing because they're seizing? Are they stopping breathing because you just gave phenobarbital? Uh, but nonetheless, there was some risk with that. The other issue with phenobarbital is there's no reversal agent. Once it's in there, it's in there. And the half-life is like measured basically in days. I can't remember, did we say it's like 50? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the half-life. So that means once you give it, 53 hours before half of it is out of their system. And then that definitely depends on their hepatic function. It depends on the volume of distribution, the clearance, all of these things. But once you've given it, it's in there. And so there's a good and bad to that. So phenobarbital typically when it's used, it's used with what's called a front loading uh, kind of strategy. So the benzodiazepines, we give them either the symptom triggered management, which means you do a CEWA and then you give them the benzodiazepine. That's one way to treat it. You can also give uh, scheduled, you'll see us do that. Like here's 100 of Librium three times a day. That's another way. And then there's the front loading. There are some centers, not a lot, but that will give a front load of benzos. So when they're down in the ED, they will give them 40 to 80 milligrams of Valium right off the bat. It's a little scary. Those are big doses, but the front loading of phenobarbital is basically the way to give it. Uh, now, we sort of reviewed all this data. Up to date has these little, what I would consider microscopic doses that look a more like, to me, like a symptom trigger management where you give a 260 or a 130. We're talking about giving a load of 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram based on ideal body weight. So let's say your average 70, 80 kilogram at most, you may be giving, you know, 700 to 1,000 milligram load compared to these little 260s or 130s that up-to-date would suggest. Uh, but with that, and that is what a lot of these centers use, some of what they'll find is, you just give one dose and that's it. Those patients, some of them will do, you know, within 15, 30 minutes, they start settling down and they may not need any more doses, their hospitalization. They've had some people who come back two weeks later for other issues and get their levels measured and they still have measurable phenobarbital levels two weeks afterwards. So there may be some benefit that once you give it to them, yes, you do have to have kind of intense monitoring right afterwards, but truly you may not need to give them any more doses. The way we're going to set up the orders is we will give the initial load and then four hours we will check a level. Typically what we're wanting to see that level is above 20. Um, if it's below, you may need additional dosing and we will have that written in so that there's a, a smaller load that can be given 
four hours later. Um, I think that's a three meg per gig. Is that? Yes. Yep. Yep. And then you could even do it again, but you would need to check another level of energy to depend on that. So, uh, in some patients, then we can switch them over to oral medicine with phenobarbital the following day, especially if they have liver disease. Typically, it's just the load and you're done because that's going to just stay in your system for days and days. So we are working on an order set that also contains phenobarbital as an additional option. Right now, we're really looking at it for those patients who are kind of resistant to benzodiazepines. So you're giving them the benzos and their CO score is increasing. That's the time to call the provider and say, hey, can we think about something else? I'm going 15, 18, 20, things are not moving in the right direction. We would also think about it in people who have had that exact syndrome before. And it's something called kindling syndrome, where it's like you're starting a fire and it's just out of control. Um, but for people who said, I've used phenobarbital before because the benzos didn't work, that's somebody else we would just start right off the bat. Once they're in the phenobarbital pathway, though, we don't cross back over. So you don't say, let's give phenobarb. They didn't respond 15 minutes later. Let's give a couple of doses of lorazepam. We, at least here, will not be switching back. If they actually have problems with agitation, the recommendation is actually use haloperidol in these patients to kind of help settle that agitation down. So, yeah, once you're phenobarbital, you don't return to benzodiazepines. Uh, just because there the issue is now you're stacking basically medications that can cause respiratory depression, one of which you cannot turn back off. So, um, the studies, though, I will tell you, and there's multiple studies now out there looking at this, the rate of respiratory depression with phenobarbital does not appear to be any different than that with benzodiazepines. And actually, some of them suggest it may be actually less than benzodiazepines. Um, so again, we think that the incidence of uh, needing to go to the ICU on a ventilator may be small, just in general. Uh, it will happen because, again, there are some patients who are so advanced in their alcohol withdrawal by the time they get to us that there's probably nothing we can do to intervene at this point. That's going to stop it. We're just going to have to treat it at that point. So you absolutely may see somebody get phenobarbital. They get the load, and they are still forwardly withdrawing. At that point, we really then need to talk about moving them down to the so if we're starting to talk about let's give them that second load and heaven forbid you're talking about let's give them the third load, it's probably time to move them to the ICU. And there they will use things like Demodex and or no Presidex and Propofol uh, to really try to get those down. So, um, question about more use of scheduled benzodiazepines. So we're going to hopefully look at those people who are moderate or high risk and say, let's just start them off on Librium right now. Um, and that's a range anywhere from 25 to 100. I honestly favor the higher dose because I've tried 25 and that doesn't seem to do a lot uh, for some of So 100 milligrams three times a day and then coupled with a symptom triggered management, I think that's likely to require less benzodiazepines. Um, but I also think you're going to see more phenobarbital, both because of the data we've talked about, but also because we're running out of benzodiazepines. So um, the issue is there's not a lot of IV left at this point. So yeah, you can try the oral, but if you've got somebody who's really agitated, you guys know how that goes. Um, here's some oral, please stop spitting on me, um, those kind of things. So, um, so I do think that we will continue to see this used more, and, and we're certainly not at the point where we need to become. We think that you know, Barbara's all predominant organization. We want to make sure people understand it, get sort of comfortable with it before we would talk about, well, should we just switch over to this now? Uh, but there, as I said, there definitely are places who have done this literally years ago. They switched even before this current shortage of information. All right. And then I think this last one is just talking a little bit about more um, treatment when we're getting the patient uh, closer to the end. So there's some new therapy, well, not new, but there's therapies that we're using more frequently now, especially for that's Neurontin. We've all seen that. But if you just even look at the actual generic name for that, it's Gabapentin. So remember the GABA receptor I was telling you about? There's a reason we use Gabapentin. So that's going to help stimulate that receptor. There's actually data to show not only does it help with withdrawals as an adjunct, it shouldn't be used by itself, but it actually helps decrease that uh, desire to keep taking in the alcohol so it can actually help within the alcohol use disorder and cessation at the time of discharge. So it's nice to get started while we're here. Uh, probably recommend a dose of like 300 milligrams twice a day, but that will of course vary a little bit based on the patient. Uh, we do recommend thiamine because that is what's uh, sort of at least in guidelines. 
uh, will help. It's really the only vitamin that's been shown to actually guideline the use therapy of drug help uh, based on studies. Not because uh, folks who have heavy alcohol use can have a vitamin replacement. And then they can develop a nasty little thing called Wernicke's encephalopathy, where if you thought things were going bad with DTs, wait till this comes along too. Wernicke's unfortunately can also be fungible. So uh, that's why you see thiamine being used. Usually it's about two to three times. Five times a day. So you may see some big doses come with that. Uh, the multivitamin folate, what I will tell you is the trials don't really support it one way or another. Um, so we're, we're not necessarily discouraging it, but it's not a pre check box anymore. If somebody wants to give them folate and multivitamin, that's okay. I don't think it's ever hurt anybody. Do I think everybody needs on a vitamin? Not necessarily. So these are what we use for when they're going home now and that we get them uh, kind of that warm handoff to the next side of care. Uh, as we talked about gabapentin, absolutely. We also have naltrexone, and you guys may have seen that. The um, IM injection is Vivitrol. Uh, but we do have an oral naltrexone that we can get them started on while they're here before we kind of transition them over to like the treatment and support center uh, with Dr. Terrell. These last two are older medications that we really don't use anymore. Acamprostate has lots of side effects and lots of interactions. And disulfiram was a medicine that basically you take it and then if you drink, you throw up. It doesn't make you want to drink any less. It just makes you vomit violently if you take both of them together. So most people figure that out really quick and they just don't take that medicine. So that doesn't work real well. It doesn't encourage you to adhere to that medication. So that's really all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have about all that. Do you want to talk about the Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I, I I guess I will say I'm not sure I have the perfect answer for that because it is tough. If you basically went on a assess the patient, you gave them medication, and now they're sleeping, the question is, do you wake them up to try to redo your assessment? Um, I honestly still think it's sort of based on your clinical judgment. And I know nobody likes to hear that answer, but you know, if you have somebody where their fever score was 16, 12, 10, and they're sleeping, I don't know I would wake that person up. I think if you had somebody that was 10, 14, 16, and they're sleeping, I do not think I would wait four hours to go back and give them their next dose of benzodiazepines, especially, because I think you're just asking for trouble at that point, because the next time you do it, it's not going to be 18, it's going to be 20 or 22, and they were just nodding off for a little bit, saving their energy, so now they can swing at you when you want them to do that. Um, so I think in general, it's probably best to kind of stick with the scale as outlined, and there's reasons why that scale is kind of spelled out like that. But I do get it if you're like, hey, this guy's finally nodding off. We've given them, you know, medicine, 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 and now they're resting calmly, and I'm not seeing any other signs. You know, so clearly you can walk in and just look at them and be like, okay, no diaphoresis. They don't look to kit. They're not tachycardic. Everything else looks pretty good. Can I hold off? I think it's probably reasonable to chart against that. If you walk in and they just look like they're shaking on the bed, but they're asleep, probably not. Um, so not the perfect answer. I would say follow the seat, follow the assessment as it's scheduled for your you know, those little instructions. But if the person's doing really well and you think, no, I think it's time to get, you know, hold off until, you know, they wake up and then I can go in and do it. I think it's probably the perfect answer. Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, we absolutely are. And the problem is we're doing it really without a lot of guardrails around it right now. And so that's why we're trying to get this work done as quick as possible. And I 100% understand. I can tell you, I personally have given phenobarbital. Now, I'm old enough to have given phenobarbital before. But um, the issue is if you see these patients, like the one I had was young and with no eyes. He was standing up on the bed, getting ready to Superman out the window if it had been open. Like we 100% gave her phenobarbital. She did end up eventually having to get rid of it. Um, but yeah, the issue is right now, especially with shortages, you're going to, I think, see it more and more commonly. Like, because the answer is, what else do we have? Um, what I will say that we will then put in the order set is just the monitoring. And so I would tell you, I would recommend close monitoring, especially if we're all getting used to this. The recommendation, like for example, an up to date would say every 15 minutes initially. So you're giving that loading dose, you're going to walk back in and just make sure is this person breathing. Now, again, incidents of respiratory depression are extraordinarily small. Nonetheless, we want to keep a close eye on them, especially for that first couple hours. Um, and then hopefully things are settling down by 15 to 30 minutes, things are in better shape. So.
That's right, yeah. So they would get the loading dose, we would check the level at four hours, and as long as it's above 20 and clinically they are doing better, we wouldn't give anything more. Now, if their level is above 20, but they're really still seem to not be doing well, in all honesty, we probably wouldn't give another dose because those people should be adequately loaded. Then the issue is this may not be all we may be dealing with something else simultaneously. And that's one of the reasons we check the levels is just to say, okay, clinically, how are they responding? And what do these levels look like? As long as they both look good, great. If they don't match, then we have to think about well, what's going on. So. Yeah, so Doug, in all of this... I just said, Heather, I need you to go in and do everything to vital signs and charting on this patient. And you're going to say, I have two other patients. <laughs> so that's what we're really honestly talking about is how do we shift that around? And Barb had mentioned if we have somebody where you're really doing SIVAs on, um, you really shouldn't be any more than one to three, regardless. I think when we're starting to say we're well, only going to give phenobarb, then we have to really have somebody dedicated who can keep an eye on the patient, at least initially after they get that load. Um, so, yeah. Not floor at all for um, step four, CCU, ED. We honestly haven't really talked about two tower whether or not. Um, I would honestly prefer to wait because I'd like to make sure we've got this all figured out on four and that everything's going smooth before we would ever bleed it over to two. I mean, two does act as a step down, so yes, they could do it, but I suspect this is sort of outside of their comfort level, especially initially. Not to say they don't get people who are withdrawing on two, though. Yeah. Now, 